excited to share this morning. Later on, at the end of the service, we are going to receive communion together. And uh, my, my message this morning is, is titled, Rejecting Rejection. Rejection, Rejecting Rejection. I couldn't say that three times fast. Rejecting Rejection. And we're going to look at um, two scriptures that you know well. And um, I believe probably a story in the Bible that you know as well. And um, at the end of the service, we're going to tie these together. Um, there, there are in Romans some foundational scripture verses that remind us what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. You don't have to wonder whether or not you're saved. The Bible tells you how to know that you're saved. And so there are these key verses in Romans. We call them the Romans Road to Salvation. And we're going to look at two of them this morning. So if you have your Bible, we're going to look at Romans 3 and Romans 6. And then if you have a third finger to mark in your Bible, we're going to land in Matthew 15. And we're going to put these scriptures together. So let me read Romans 3. I'm going to go to verse 23. It says, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Now that's leading into verse 23. That phrase is very important. And it says, verse 23, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now listen to verse 24. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now, we look at that to say, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We look at that verse and we say, all of humanity, everyone out there has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's accurate. Every single one of us, as cute as that baby is, it will sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all have. And so we have always looked at that verse and said, here the writer is talking about everyone out there, all of humanity. But verse 22 provides a little bit of the context. It says there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, we can look at that verse and say all of humanity. But the writer is speaking specifically to Jew and Gentile. In other words, Gentiles, you do not need to become more Jewish. Because even they have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Jews, you don't need to become more like a Gentile because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.22 setting up this verse we know so well. So we've always looked at this scripture and we've always thought it means everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the context here is, stop looking at the behavior of someone else, thinking, if I just behave more like them, it's saying, no, no, they too have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And listen, if you're not a believer in here this morning, first of all, welcome. But you do not need to act more like a Christian to be saved. Because guess what? We have all sinned. And falling short of God's glory. Our behavior does not make us accepted by God. What a beautiful scripture here. We've, we're all on the same level. And we've fallen short. We've all failed. I was talking to Andy earlier. He took um, a class that he completed yesterday. And I don't know if you mind me sharing this story. He doesn't know what the story is yet. <laughs> he was telling me this this morning. And, and um, I had to take some tests as well this week, and we've been sharing stories back and forth, and, and he said, I, I didn't finish the book. And he said, so here I'm going in and taking the test, and everyone in there, he's like, I didn't want to tell them, you know, I didn't, I didn't even finish the book, I'm not really ready for this test. So somebody asked him, they said, Andy, what did you think of the textbook? What did you think of the book? And I'm sure he looked down and you know, tried to think of an excuse, and he just confessed and said, you know, I didn't like it, and I didn't finish it. And this person said to him, I didn't either. I didn't read the book either. So Andy tells me, once they started to ask around, almost every single person did not finish the textbook, and yet was there to take the test. 
they all fell short of this. They were all on the same playing level. And that's what the writer is saying here. We're all on the same level. You don't need to act like them. Don't compare yourself to them. They too have fallen. They are not what you're striving for. Our picture is Christ. Our picture is Christ who we look to. Now, here's Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're going to end on that scripture verse. If you look in your Bible, this is Matthew 15.21-28. And these scripture verses, if this is the only portion of scripture you've ever read, it could really confuse you on who Jesus Christ is. Because we see and we hear from his own words that he is rejecting someone. And it bothers us to hear Jesus say what he says in these verses. It bothers us. It causes us to say, what? What does that mean? And it starts in verse 21, Matthew 15, verse 21. It says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Verse 22, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. So it says, Jesus is leaving one place. He was in a Jewish settlement, he was preaching, and he was teaching, and there were large crowds, and he was doing miracles. In scripture here, in the context, it says, he leaves that place. He leaves that place where he's doing miracles, and he has a big crowd, and it says exactly where he's going. He withdraws, and he goes in this land, and he goes in a place where Jew and Gentile are together. So he leaves the safe place of a Jewish settlement, and he goes in this very narrow place. And he's in this vicinity where there is a Canaanite woman from that vicinity. I love the picture here of what Jesus Christ did. It's exactly where you belong. We come to church, and we worship, and we sing, and we listen to God's word. But we leave that place, and we go in a vicinity where there are believers and unbelievers, and it is exactly where you belong. Jesus is on a mission to reach one person. He's going to minister to one person. He leaves the crowd. He leaves the revival. He leaves the miracles. He withdraws from that. And he goes to this very narrow place between two worlds. And listen, believer, this morning, you belong in that place between two worlds. We belong in a place where we're saying, God, I really need your kingdom to come right here. God, I need you to do something at my work. God, I need you to do something in my family. God, I need you to do something in my neighborhood. God, I need you to do something right here. I'm not in that safe place. God, I'm not there. I'm in a place where there's tension. God, I'm in a place where there's people that are hurting. And maybe it's me. And maybe it's a family member. It's the exact place where God loves to put us in that narrow place. And she calls out to him, and she says, Lord, son of David. Now, she's a Canaanite woman. She says, Lord, son of the Jews. You're not my God. You're their God. She says, Lord, God of those other people, have mercy on me. You're not my God, you're their God, but will you help me out? See how she still wants to put a, put a distance between the two? She's like, you're their God, and I hear you do things. Will you do something for me? In verse 23, it says, Jesus does not answer the word. Imagine that. We have this lady crying out a desperate need, and Jesus does not say a word. Have you ever felt like that when you prayed? Maybe it's a prayer you've prayed for years. And you're like, God, I feel like you're not saying a word. 
God, where's the answer? Where's the end? I'll take a detour. I'll take a sign that says rerouting, rerouting, so I know that you're at least listening. And here, he's not saying a word. So, because Jesus did not say a word, the disciples did, which happens a lot, doesn't it? You'll have around you at times when you're having trouble hearing God, you'll have voices show up. Be careful. Voices that are not God. I don't mean voices in your head. I mean people around you who would love to give you advice. Who would love to say, hey, maybe you ought to try this. If it's not faith, if it's not hope, if it's not the word of God, it's man-made advice. And that's what the disciples do. They say, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. Again, you read these scriptures and you're like, disciples, what is wrong with you? How could you go to Jesus and say, Jesus, you're not saying anything, so here's what we think you ought to do. Can you imagine that? God, you haven't showed up yet, so I'm going to do my own thing. And then here's what they say, get rid of her. Kick her out. Has Jesus ever done that? I mean, up until this point, do they have a prior experience where Jesus says, hey, their need is too big. Will you go send them away? Can you imagine that? That's what they're saying. They're like, she's annoying. She's loud. Get rid of her. Just say the word. Especially we'll get Peter. He's always got a sword on him. Say the word, and we'll get Peter to make her go. And here's what Jesus says. We're like, here's the moment where he gets after him. And listen to what Jesus says. I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus' answer is, she's not mine. Now here's what's interesting. He just requoted what she said. He just said what she said. She's the one who said, Lord, son of David. Lord, king of them. And they're like, do something with her. And he says, listen. She said it. I'm only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. The foundation of your life with Christ is understanding your identity in Him. When your situation doesn't match, when a sickness in your body doesn't match, when something's going on that does not match what's in the Scripture, you have to remember your identity in Christ. Things, things really changed in our home once my son turned 16. He got a little card this big called a driver's license. <laughs> a lot of things changed in our home. The first thing was our insurance went up. And then he had to get his own car, and he had this new freedom. He would come home from school saying, hey, I'm going to go hang with friends. And it came out of my mouth. I was going to say, where do you want me to take you? He's like, I'm good. I got my car. And, and I wasn't ready for this. My wife and I weren't ready for this. And, and he's in the room, so he's going to know this. On our phones, you can do find a phone, and you can always track where he's at. And so we would, I'd be like, Ron, when's the last time you checked? Five minutes. Okay, it's my turn. All right, yeah, he's still here. He's still here. Okay, you check that. You check. So, oh, that helps. Some, sometimes technology helps. And listen, my kids are wonderful. Most of the time. He never, ever missed curfew. Always came home on time. And we could check. He's always where he said he was going to be. His curfew is 11 o'clock. One night at 10.30, I get a text from him. And he's like, hey, Dad, I need to take a buddy home. I'm going to be late for curfew. And I quickly sent him a text back, and I'm like, no. Tell this guy to find his own ride home. Your curfew is 11 o'clock. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good dad moment. I told him like it is. And about 10 minutes later, I get another text. And I look, and it's Jace. And he says, hey, Dad, one of my friends is getting ready to go out of town. I'd really like to spend some extra time with him. 
can I come home a few minutes late tonight? And I'm like, I can't bend, I can't break. And I say, no, absolutely not. Your curfew, you know it, is 11 o'clock. And I hit set. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a good, tough, firm, but gracious dad. I'm doing this thing. And then at 10.55, I get a text. And it says, Dad, I'm going to be late. And, and there's more words to the text, but I'm so angry, it's just like a blur in front of me. I'm like, what? What? And, and finally, when, when the anger subsides just a little bit, I read the rest of the text, and it says, I had trouble getting my bill from the waitress. I just now got it, just now paid, and I'm going to be late. And I go into the bedroom. My wife's in there, getting ready for bed, and I said, Ronan, look at this. Look at this. Look what he did. And she's like, oh, oh okay. And I'm like, Ronan, look. He tricked me. He tricked me. Twice he asked, and I said no. And then at the last minute, he says he's going to be late. And it's like he completely manipulated and tricked me. And, and I laid down in bed with her. The lights were off in our bedroom. And I just started to talk. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to take away. I'm going to take his car. I'm going to take his cell phone. I'm going to take his clothes. I'm going to take, well, I can't do that. I'm going to take away everything. I'm going to take away friends. I'm going to take away air. I'm going to take away food. I'm going to, he's never, ever gotten in trouble. And so, of course, I'm going overboard. And I'm laying in bed, and I'm thinking of all the ways that I'm going to punish him so he never does it again, and I hear his car pull in a driveway. And I hear his key on the door, and I hear him come in. I'm not asleep. I'm laying in bed, and I'm still thinking, what am I going to do? How am I going to handle this? And I hear him walking down the hallway, and he opens our bedroom door, and he looks in. Now, he looks in, and he's just see, he sees that it's dark. I'm not asleep. My wife's not asleep. But he assumes we are, and he shuts our bedroom door, he goes in the restroom, and then he goes to his bedroom. And I'm laying in there, and I'm thinking, no way. No way. No way. And I'm like, Ronan, this boy's going to get it. And so I, but I, you know, I wasn't ready yet. I didn't have my speech down. I didn't know how I was going to handle this yet. I didn't have it planned out. Are you still about to tell this story, Jace? I didn't have it all figured out yet, but I said, no, we're going to deal with this tonight. So I get out of bed, throw open the door, and you know how you walk, Matt? If you've got a teenager, you know what walking bad is. You just, you know? And I'm walking to his room, and I'm like, man, I still don't have this together. Like, like I still don't know the words and how I'm going to do this, and I want it to impact him in a good way. I want this to impact him. I want him to remember that, you know, we don't do this in our house. And, you know, as for me and my house, we serve the Lord, you know, and I'm going to set him straight. And, and I get down to his room, and I, and I open the door, and I'm ready to take this on. And I hear him in bed, and he's crying. And I'm telling him, my mama said it to me, and I'm sure her mom said it to her. And I'm sure her mom said it to her. But I was thinking that phrase I had heard over and over and over in my life, I'll give you something to cry about. I mean, if you heard that growing up. <laughs> I didn't say it, but I was thinking it. And then something happened over me. I'm there, and I'm ready to punish my son. But there's this picture of him laying in bed, you know, tears running down his face. And then he realizes that I'm in there. I'm in there with him. And he says, before I say a word, he's like, Dad, I am so, so sorry. And here's what he says, Dad, I don't want you to think that I tried to pull one over on you. Dad, I am so sorry. The waitress had the bills all messed up. I could not get it. But Dad, I am so sorry that now you think that I deceived and lied to you. And as soon as he did that, something 
broke over me. And I thought to myself, no way. No, 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 no. No way is my son. There is no way that my child is not going to understand who he is in my house. I got in bed with my son. I put my arm around him, and I said, no, 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 no. There is nothing, nothing you could ever do wrong that changes who you are in this house. JC, you are mine. You are your mom's. We have paid too big a price. We have sacrificed way too much. There is nothing you can do that you are no longer my son. And listen to me, church. No, 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 no. There is nothing you can do to separate yourself from the love of God. He has done too much. Sending his son was the ultimate price. There is nothing you've done. There is nothing you've experienced. There is nothing you're going to do right now that has separated you from your Lord Jesus Christ. Our identity in Christ is secure yes. as long as we stay in Him. Yes. And this lady, that's what she had to get. She had to stop saying, Lord God of them, just help me, but still stay out there. He's like, no, I want yes. you. I want you. <coughs> so the woman, listen to what she does next. The woman came and knelt before him. And she says, Lord, help me. Catch this picture. This lady who says, Lord, God of them, help me. To hear in verse 25, she goes before him, she kneels, and she says, my Lord, help me. She now says, I am so desperate. My situation is so great. Be my Lord. Now this is not as simple as, here's somebody in the Bible that gives their heart and life to Jesus Christ. No, she is a Canaanite woman in her own town where Jesus showed up. And she just knelt before a Jewish man. As soon as she does what she does and says what she says, she just earned the rejection of everyone she knows. They're like, what are you saying? He is not your God. He is not your Lord. Why are you kneeling before a Jewish man? Every family member she has, she instantly earned their rejection. Every co-worker she has, as soon as she does this and says this, she earns their total rejection. We don't bow to them. We have fought them for generations and generations in generations. You don't bow before them and say, you are my Lord. And listen, if you're fully going to embrace the life that Christ has for you, you have to come to terms with rejection. What he has for me is so much better than their acceptance. What he has for me is so much better than what they have for me. Whatever you can offer me, you can't save me like he can. Whatever you have to offer me, you can't heal me. You don't have hope and joy and peace like he has. We have to come to terms with rejection. And listen, almost always, the people who are rejecting you are not rejecting you. They're acting out their own rejection. I, I worked... A few years ago, I worked for a retail store, and I was in management there. And one day, I got a phone call at work, and it was our human resources department. And they said, Joe, we need to meet with you. This is never a good thing. 
And so I sit down and I'm sitting in down in front of a human resource manager and they had a stack of papers on their desk about this talk. And this gentleman says to me, he says, I need to talk to you about some of the things that you've done here at work. And I felt completely blindsided. Open the first folder and he said, I have a record here that somebody who works for you, somebody who works under you, was telling you about a situation they were going through in their family and that you offered to pray for them. Did you, on the clock, at work, someone who works for you, did you offer to pray for them right there at work? So right here in our building, you offered to pray for them. And I was about to answer and defend myself. It was absolutely true. And I was even wondering, how do I answer that it's true, but then try to cover for myself? And before the words came out of my mouth, they said, no, 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 don't say a word. They closed the folder and scooted it over. They opened another one. They said, we have another report. We have a report here that there's somebody who works for you that has a teenager. This teenager has run away from home a couple times, and you were talking to them, and you were encouraging them, and you encouraged our entire family to start going to church. Now it says here you didn't invite them to your church, but that your advice to them was that God could put their family back together and God could do miraculous things. And I, as I'm listening to this, I'm like, man, this is a good sermon you're preaching there. <laughs> and I'm starting to be like, but I'm just trying to help. I was just, as soon as I start to talk, they say, no, don't say a word. And they close the folder and they screwed it over. And I thought, how many folders are there? They open the next one. And it's another similar situation. And as soon, and I'm just getting angry. Like, you're not giving me a chance to defend myself. And as they're going through folder after folder after folder, these incidents of where I just prayed for people or encouraged them or spent time with them and listened to their story, and I just started to get more and more angry. And I thought, I'm going to get fired from my job for just being a Christian, for just loving on people that work for me and and praying for them and encouraging them, and they got to the last folder, and they said, Joe, do not say a word. Did the last folder and push it to the side. And this human resource manager said, Joe, I need you to understand something. Everything you've done here, this whole stack, in all these situations, and all these records of everything you've done, and what you've been doing here on the job, and how you've been interacting with people. And he said, listen to me, this is very important. This is the exact reason that we hired you. We wanted you to pastor people at this company. And I was dumbfounded. I was like, what? What? And he said, he says, listen to me, Joe. I need you to continue to do exactly what you've been doing. Keep doing what you're doing. You're making an impact. But he said, listen to me. He said, I couldn't let you talk during this meeting. Anything you said, I had to write down, and it goes in your permanent record. He's like, what I say does not go in the record. But if you defend yourself, if you say anything, I've got to write it down, and it goes in that folder. And he says, listen to me. If after this meeting today, you go up to one of those people and you say to them, hey, I heard you went to human resource. I, hey, I heard you filed a report. He said, if you go up to one of them, a single one of them, you're automatically fired. You cannot defend yourself at all. So here's what he said. Keep doing what you're doing. Never defend yourself. If you defend yourself, we can't help you. But keep doing what you're doing. Listen, that's heaven, the advice it's giving you. Keep doing what I told you to do. The resistance, the pushback, 
you can't handle. The criticism, the rejection. If you stop doing what you're doing to handle this, you've lost what God wants you to do. He's got a mission. He's got a purpose. He's got a reason for you to be where you're at. Keep doing what God has called you to do, no matter how much rejection. No matter how much pushback from whoever it is. Heaven can do something supernatural if you stay here. If you move here, you're on your own. You are not your defender. You cannot handle rejection. The only way to handle rejection from others is to remember you're his son. You're his daughter. What can they say to change that? Nothing. What can they do to change that? We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of his glory. But listen, but you've been bought by a price. And so you are secure in him. And he says to her, listen to this. She bows before him and says, Lord, help me. And he replies to her and says, verse 26, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. I can't believe Jesus said that to this lady. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Listen to what she says. It doesn't faze her one bit. She says, yes, it is, Lord. How many times in the Bible does somebody argue with Jesus and win? I only know of one. <laughs> he's doing something here. There's a purpose to what he's doing. He says, it's not right. She says, yes, it is. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. She says, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. This, this story, what's next? Immediately following the story in your Bible. So it says, Jesus leaves the place of miracles. He travels right here. And he has this encounter with one person, this woman, one person. And then Jesus leaves, and he goes back to a Jewish settlement, and he's about to feed the 4,000. Okay? So he leaves the miracle, he visits this one woman, and he ends his conversation with her and says, is it right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs? He's about to stand before 4,000 men, so 10,000 people probably, and the disciples are going to come to him and say, there's not enough bread to feed the crowd. This woman, Jesus says, there's not enough bread. And she says, yes, there is. Here's enough. Here's what she says. I only need a crumb. I only need a little bit. And listen, no matter what you're going through, there's enough. No matter what your situation is, it's not too much. Your situation is not too much for God. There is still enough grace. There is still enough hope. There is still enough. And there are situations that you're going through that you can't control. We all have them. And if you're like me, you wish you could. We wish we could control other people, how they think and how they talk and how they act. But it doesn't work. If you're married, you learn that in the first five days. It doesn't work. We can't control us. <laughs> we can't control someone else. And listen, if you're going through a situation, you feel like, I'm not in control. Like, I can't make them see. I can't make them do. I can't. Sometimes it feels so helpless. And I look at myself and I say, why do I say those things? And why the things I should be saying, do I not do them? And guess what? That's Paul. Paul says, why do I do these things and I don't want to? And why do I keep doing that and I don't want to? And I'm like, yes, 
that's me, that echoes with me, it resonates. Why do we do, guess what, no matter how much you feel like, there's nothing I can do, he's got enough. This lady is at a place, there's nothing she can do. Her daughter's in need and there's nothing she can do and there's nothing anyone else can do. And she says, I don't need the loaf, I just need a piece. If I can have one touch of what you have, Jesus Christ, and here's what he says. Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Romans 6.23, the scripture we read earlier. It says this about living a life apart from Christ. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So I want you to, want you to listen to these two pictures. The wage of sin is death. The wage, what you can earn on your own, is not enough. It's death. Whatever you can accomplish still ends in death. But the gift, so understand that picture. A wage of what you can earn in a gift that you didn't earn at all. The, the context here, the root words that are being used. When it says the wage, there's, there's a picture, and you can see it earlier in this verse. It's a picture of talking about a slave and a master. And the Greek word, when it talks about wages, it means a soldier's fee. And so when you read that, it says... The soldier's fee, what the soldier receives in battle, is death. A soldier might win today. A soldier might survive on the battlefield today. And he might make it the next battle. But eventually, that soldier will earn death. And there are things that we can accomplish outside of God. You can live life apart from God if you want. There are areas of your life where you could say, God, you're good, but I can handle my business. I want my own wage in this area of my life. Maybe it's with relationships. God, I'll worship you on Sunday. I'll worship you on Wednesday. And oh, I love the music. But listen, there are areas of my life that I'm going to manage. There are areas and decisions that I make how I spend my money and how I, that's my thing. God, I, I love you, but there are areas of my life that are still mine. I still want to earn my wage. I still want to do it my way. And you might have friends that are not believers. And you see them do things and they taste a level of success. And you might even ask yourself, how are they so successful in my business? They're not a believer. How does their family look like it's so good? They're not believers. They never go to church. How come they're not sick in their body? <laughs> they don't believe that Jesus is a healer. It, it does not seem fair. It doesn't see. I'm struggling, and I'm a believer. I, my body's sick, and I believe in Jesus Christ as my healer. I don't understand. Listen, one day, that soldier's wage is death. And listen, if you're living life for yourself, if you're living life based on your skill and your ambition and your ability, listen to me, one day you're going to die on that field. <clears throat> you ever see a movie or a TV show and it's a man or a woman and they're starting to age but maybe they've been a bank robber and they're having a conversation and here's what they say. After this next heist, I'll retire. Right? And that kind of sets up the movie or the television show. They'll say, I just need the big one. I just, I, if I could just get that big heist, then I could stop all this. You know, every one of those TV shows, I'll tell you how that ends. There's another heist next. It's never enough. Like, they do that heist, and they're like, well, that's good, but now there's another one. And then there's another one. And eventually, all that doing and scheming, it ends in death. So what does God offer you? It's free. There's no scheming. There's no manipulating. 
There's no what you can work for, and you can, it's totally free gift. Life in Jesus Christ. And so God, I just pray this morning, I pray that we will reject rejection. I pray it in Jesus' name. God, I pray even that story I shared this morning about standing in front of someone and they said, keep doing what you're doing, but don't ever defend yourself. God, I pray right now that you will give us the boldness to obey you and to follow you and not care what anyone says. God, I pray, just like the story in the Bible here, how she knelt before you and said, you are my God. God, we bow before you today and say, God, you are my God. God. God, I pray right now. I pray whatever you've spoken to us, whatever you put in our hearts, God, whatever callings and giftings and dreams and passions and desires and listening to the Holy Spirit, God, I pray you give us the boldness to pick it up and run with it in Jesus' name. God, we receive what you have for us in Jesus' name. We receive it in Jesus' name. God, I pray that we will be a church on mission. God, we will be a people on mission. And Jesus Christ, just as you did, you left a place where people were being healed, saved, and delivered, and put yourself where someone was hurting and struggling. And God, I pray that you'll do that with us. God, make us men and women on mission. Move us to where hurting people are. God, move us to where people are in need, where people are calling out, God, help me. And God, I pray right now that we will know who we are in you and be secure in our identity in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If the ushers will make their way up this morning, we're going to receive communion together. It's, it's an honor for me. This is the first time that we've received communion together. And this morning, I want to let you know that when we receive communion, the only requirement as we receive communion is that you're a believer in Jesus Christ. If you're, if you're visiting this morning, if you're not a member of our church, that's okay. Um, the only thing, and just as we have it inscribed right on the front of our table, is that we do it in remembrance of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. And I want to give you an opportunity this morning, if you're here today, and you would say, I'm not a believer in Jesus Christ. I've not given my heart and life to him. I'm, I'm not saved this morning. I love, we talked about this last week, what Peter said when he was quoting the prophet Joel. He said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you might be in here this morning, and you're like, now wait a second. That sounds way too easy. It sounds way too easy that all I have to do is call on Jesus Christ and I'm saved. It seems way too easy. It's got to be more complicated than that. It was. Heaven had to come to earth. Jesus had to live in 